Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, and today I'm very excited to have a very special guest with us. This is Teresa Wright, and she is a professional who focuses on eating disorders, and she's going to tell us a little about herself and what she does. And so, uh, Teresa, I'm very excited to have you. Why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Well, I'm a registered dietitian and a licensed nutritionist. I have a bachelor's and a master's in nutrition. I've been running a private practice in nutrition counseling for 37 years. I got into this very much by accident. Um, a client led me to her therapist who taught me what I needed to do. And I've been working with people around the problems with food, eating, and body weight for all these years. Now, when, you know, so many people in the United States have problems, whether it be food addiction or bulimia or um, having, you know, all different types of problems where they use um, emotions to compensate, you know, food for emotions, you know, uh, what are some ways that people could um, help themselves if they see themselves, you know, struggling with a certain type of disorder or an addiction to food? Um, what are some ways people could actually help themselves? Well, the first thing you have to do is stop fighting against the fact that you're having a problem. Mm -hmm. That's called acceptance. Right. Nobody likes having to struggle with food eating and body weight. Yes. And it is a struggle. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I think that obesity is the symptom, the cause, or the result of something else. And we have to look for what the something else is. Yes. It's sort of like if you went to your doctor with an ear infection and he gave you a pain reliever and a decongestant, you'd feel better, but mm -hmm. the ear infection would still be there and right. it would come back to haunt you again and again. Mm -hmm. The same thing is with our weight loss culture. When we want to diet, and lose weight or when we want to to maintain a really low body weight or when we struggle with feelings around food mm. we have to look at it's it's not necessarily the problem of the food or the diet sometimes it's feelings yes and sometimes it's a physical sensitivity you mentioned food addiction well if I look at my clients who agree that they're food addicts, a lot of them have alcoholics and drug addicts and gamblers and and uh, shoppers in their families. Right. This is a physical brain thing. Yeah. To get a kind of high from that. The other thing that goes on is Americans have so much processed and man-made food yes if you go to the grocery store 80 percent of the food that is in the grocery store is refined processed and man-made yes and when we refine and over process our foods they affect our brain differently mm -hmm. and for some people who are sensitive their brain responds in a different way yeah. from the way other people do. And so then they have this urgency to continue eating. Mm -hmm. And they eat and they eat and they eat until they're stuffed and feeling guilty and miserable. And then they go to bed and tomorrow morning they get up and say, I'm not going to eat anything today because I ate so much last night. And they get themselves really hungry and really guilty. Right. And they binge again. And so what I have to teach people to do is eat in a healthy, nutrient-rich way. Right. You know, the body is a gift to the mind and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And we need to treat the body with dignity and respect. Of course, yes. Now, I feel like um, a lot a lot of times when people eat or they binge, 
a lot of it, like we mentioned earlier, you know, there is a root cause. There is a reason why, whether they came from a dysfunctional family, whether they were told they were either too fat or too too skinny, or they use food for gratification for their emotions, um, you know, is 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 it first, is it better to get psychological help where you go to a therapist or you talk to somebody to overcome your, um, your, your problems that may be the root cause for your behaviors? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we have bad feelings, we have to get them out and manage them and handle them somehow. Otherwise, we're just going to eat and push them down. Right. A lot of people get a great deal of help just from journaling, yes. from writing down what they're thinking and feeling, and maybe looking at it um, later and deciding what help they need. A lot of people um, use 12-step programs like Overeaters Anonymous, mm -hmm. um, but the thing I want people to know is it's not possible to do this by yourself. Right. I'm strong and I'm determined. I can do this by your, myself. No, that won't work. I was watching the Masters Golf Tournament mm -hmm. quite by accident because I never watch golf. <laughs> but this dude was leading the pack. And I realized that everybody at the tournament had somebody carrying their golf clubs. But these guys didn't just carry the golf draw clubs. They were consultants to the Masters Golf Tournament. Right. The big guy knelt down and conversed with his caddy about which way he was going to shoot this, mm -hmm. this golf ball. And he disagreed with the caddy and he shot it his way. And the golf ball landed in the trees. Mm -hmm which is a very bad place for a golf ball to be. Yes, it is. <laughs> and he turned around and looked at his caddy and said, what looked to me like, oh, hell, you were right. <laughs> that was the expression on his face. Yeah. So even the really well-paid professionals have advisors they trust. Yes. So in a way, and... AA people have sponsors mm -hmm. and other support people. Yes. And that helps. That's someone you can call at nine o'clock on Sunday night when you're having a problem. Right. And we use psychotherapists to help us process the feelings, get rid of them, get through them, let go of them. Yes. And I'm honored that people use me and people like me to teach them how to eat differently. Yeah. So for instance, the body needs to be fed every three to five hours while you're awake. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to go eight or nine hours without eating, then when you sit down to eat, you're going to want to binge because you're over hungry. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Go ahead. No, I, I said, I hear so many people say, well, I didn't have the time to sit down. I was too busy either with work or this or that, you know, but then you see them when they do finally eat, like you said, they're binging and they're overeating because they're so hungry from, you know, it's taking long spans of not getting the small portions throughout the day that they needed. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I do is teach my clients how to carry easy to eat snacks with mm -hmm. them, like two cheese sticks and a piece of fruit is easy. It fits in your briefcase. Yes. You can eat it at your desk mm -hmm. and you'll feel better. And then you go on. And when you have that at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're not so ravenous at dinner time. Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, so you're happier that way. And I also find, you know, when I went to Europe, uh, most of the food that we sold in America was actually banned in Europe. And I think even when you go into the food stores, you know, the marketing on these labels are so 
um, fraud like they you know they try to trick the consumer making it seem like it's healthy when it's actually not you know so many times you know they'll say you know um no more uh no added preservatives well it has preservatives in it it's just they, they didn't add any extras besides the ones they actually put in the product so it's you know they use market employees to make people think that it's actually a healthy product when it's not. Maybe you could tell our listeners some of the foods and some of the ways that they should be eating to overcome their food disorder and to help them on their way to recovery. I'll be happy to do that. But the first thing I want to say is mm -hmm. you are so right about the food labels. You have to turn to the back of the package and there's this little thing that says ingredients. Yes. And you, the ingredients are listed in decreasing order by weight. Mm -hmm. And you have to go through that ingredient list and know what those words mean. Yes. I give my clients 160 item list of different names for sugars. Mm-hmm. And if anyone wants that, they can go to my website at www.sanefood.com and get a copy of the sugars list. Yeah. You That's have great. all these different names for sugar. Mm -hmm. And you look at them and say, what am I doing? I have five sugars in this product. Why do I need that? Right. And then I got furious one day in the grocery store. And a beautiful green package with leaf, green leaves on it, pure stevia. Now, stevia is an artificial sweetener right. that's been generally regarded as safe for some time. Mm -hmm. And it said pure stevia. When I turned over and looked at the ingredient list, it said dextrose, comma, stevia. Mm. That means there was more sugar than stevia in the product. Right. Well, that wasn't what I was out there for. Yeah. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. And that deludes people into thinking they're not using sugar when they really are using sugar. Exactly. Really annoying. Yeah. So we have to read the ingredient list. I always say if you can't pronounce it, then you shouldn't be buying the product. Because right. when you look in the back of the ingredients, if you can't pronounce those words, then obviously they're not good for you. If you don't know what they are, why why should you eat it? Yeah. And you 100%. Know, mm -hmm. We need to focus more on eating foods that um, God and Mother Nature planned for us. Yes, 100%. Home foods and real foods, foods the way God and Mother Nature planned them. Yes. You know, and people don't realize, but how we, the foods we put in our body play such an impact on how we feel and how we look. If our body um, gets food and they start breaking down the food and they don't know what it is, then they're going to start storing it because they don't know where it goes. So then you have all these toxins that are being stored in your body. It's affecting all your organs. It's affecting the way you feel. It's affecting you mentally and you're having trouble focusing your clarity and could even cause illness and obesity and other illnesses that people struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. There are even like ramen noodles. They had a uh, study done and the, in the ramen noodles, the, the, um, packets had, um, they had ingredients in them that actually, um, did something to the brain and could cause illnesses, uh, because of the certain ingredients that were in the ramen noodles. Well, you, you know, you go into any college kids kitchen, you're going to find packets and packets and packets of ramen noodles. And it's one of the worst things for you. Mm -hmm. It damages your brain health. Yeah. You know, so we have to know how to do this. Yes. Now, what would be some of your suggestions when people, should they to maybe prepare the food the day before? They should start making a list of what they are eating and maybe focus on, on a healthy, more structured way of eating? Yeah. What I do is I write individualized food plans 
Mm -hmm. each person who comes to me. I sit down with my calculator and figure out how many calories and how much protein and how much fat the person needs. And we together write a food plan that fits them. But the first thing ahead of all this that I want to say is you have to make a decision. Yes. You have to make the decision that I'm going to do stuff with food. I'm going to find ways to do it. It's going to take me three months to get settled on a new pattern. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make mistakes. And when I make a mistake, I'm going to look at what caused the mistake. Yes. And how I could have avoided it. Yes. And I'm going to go on with my life. So the first step is the decision. The second step is we don't drink enough water. Right. I mean, the, the rules say we're supposed to have take half our body weight and drink that much water, that many ounces of water a day. Well, that's a lot more water than most Americans drink. <laughs> and remember, you were talking about the toxins and the poisons yeah. from processed and man made foods. Mm -hmm. How's the body going to get that out of the body? Right. You need the it's water. To wash it out with water. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to lose weight, the end products of fat uh, metabolism are ketone bodies. Mm -hmm. ketone bodies have an ammonia molecule in them so they're not very comfortable for the body right so you send that to the kidney and if that sits in the kidney long enough that the kidney gets annoyed about it yeah it's going to send that ketone body back to the liver mm -hmm. and the liver's going to turn it into a fat cell again right now wait a minute I did a study with some of my weight loss groups. If you don't drink enough water, you can cut off between 20 and 30% of your weight loss. Yeah. Well, now, come on. Do you, if you are really on a weight loss program, do you want to cut off 20 or 30% of your weight loss? No. Exactly. You have to drink the water. Yes. And it can't be diet soda. No. It can't be sweetened with artificial stuff. Mm -hmm. You can get a lemonade with fresh lemon in it, and that'll be fine. Right. You can get seltzer water, and you can put fruit or other flavors in it. But you need to not use the artificially sweetened sodas for your water. Right. Intake. And soda is so bad for you. Mm -hmm. I remember we had a, um, a relative of mine that used to, to entertain the children. He used to show the kids how bad Coca-Cola was. And he would put um, a penny in a little cup, fill it up with Coca-Cola. And by the time the party was over, the, um, the penny had disintegrated because of all the chemicals and ingredients yeah. that was in the soda. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Yeah. I have but, to go home and dry it, buy a bottle of Coke and try that. I've never seen that happen. So imagine, imagine what must be in there if, if it, if it is powerful enough to do that. If it's powerful enough to dissolve a penny, you know, it's powerful. <laughs> and what could it could do to your body? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plan uh, to get enough water. Mm -hmm. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to plan to eat every three to five hours mm -hmm. through the day. Now, that means different things for different people. Right. If you're a nurse and you work from midnight to 8 a.m., you're going to have your main meal of the day at 10 o'clock at night before you go to work. And you're going to have your lunch and maybe a snack while you're at work. And then you're going to come home and have breakfast at eight or nine o'clock. And then you're going to bed. Right. All right. Now, if you have school children, 
you're going to be driving them to school at 7.30 or 8 o'clock or getting them on the school bus. Mm -hmm. And they have to have breakfast before they go to school. And then maybe you'll have breakfast with them or maybe you'll come home afterwards and have breakfast. Right. And then are you going to work? Well, if you have to be at work by 8.30, what time is lunch? And what time are you done work? Yeah. You have to look some companies Lunch is at 11.30 to 12.30. Mm -hmm. And some companies' lunch isn't until 1.30 or 2. Right. And if that's your case, you might have to eat at 10 in the morning and have a snack. Right. And if you're going to be stuck working until 6 or 8 in the evening, I want you to have a bunch of snacks in your desk drawer so that you can have just something quick at three or four in the afternoon right. to keep you till dinner. Now, what the, is that likely to be something like um, an ounce of raisins and an ounce of nuts? Mm -hmm. Two ounces of uh, cheese and a piece of fruit. What can you get in your office that will work for you that's not a Dunkin' Donut Danish? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important. And, you know, for people who are trying to either, you know, break the, the bad eating habits, you know, what time do you think a person should stop eating? It depends. If dinner is at five or six in the evening, People want to have a snack at eight or nine, go to bed at 10 or 11. That's fine. Mm -hmm. If dinner is at seven or eight in the evening and you're going to bed at 10 or 11, then you don't need something before you go to bed, but you probably needed something at three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Now, my favorite bedtime snack is a cup of yogurt and a cup of fruit. Mm -hmm. It's sweet. It's soothing. It's gentle. Right. It's not a big deal. If you want, you can put that yogurt and fruit in the freezer. Right. For half an hour and it'll taste delicious. Mm -hmm. Or you can cook the fruit in the microwave and put the cold yogurt on top of it. Yeah. That'll taste delicious too. And I think when you were saying about sugar, you know, the more sugar you eat, the more you want, want to eat, you know, it, it increases your appetite. So, you know. Absolutely. Sugar causes your pancreas to release a hormone named insulin, and that brings your blood sugar down. So then the body wants more food. So if you're going to drink a regular soda, in an hour you're going to be hungry. Right. Because the pancreas is going to lower your blood sugar, and you're going to feel the need for more food. Right. Right. Let's see. There has to be one real meal in a day. Mm -hmm. You have to have a meal that is your, your big safety net meal, your comfort meal. Right. I want people to have protein about this much. Mm -hmm. of beef, lamb, pork, veal, chicken, eggs, fish, etc. Right. And a scoop like this some sort of whole grain carbohydrate mm -hmm. um, and then we want to have some vegetables yeah. besides salad maybe and then we want to have a couple tablespoons of a good polyunsaturated and monounsaturated vegetable oil mm -hmm. so all the hormones in the body are made from fat and 67% of the weight of the brain is fat cells. Mm -hmm. So if the hormones in the body are made from fat, the nerve cells are made from fat, right. the brain cells are made from fat, and you go on a fat-free diet, well, can the body use the stored fat for those things? Or is it that those fats that are stored won't work for the brain cells. Right. So the body gets short shrift. 
When my clients spend a long time on a fat-free diet, their skin gets dry, their hair falls out, and their nails get brittle and break, and they have no energy. Yeah. That's because the body sees those services as optional. Right. So it cuts them off first. Yeah. That's why one of the reasons that there are no baby boomers in certain parts of Europe after the Second World War, because there wasn't enough food and enough fat mm. to go around. So, so we have to pay attention to getting the right amount of fat in the body. Right. That's a very good point. Very good point. And the body thinks that if there's no fat, that we're going to starve. And the body doesn't want to starve. So then it'll hold on to all of its stored nutrients and mm -hmm. you won't wait. It's fascinating to me when I have a client come into me with struggling for weeks and months with not losing weight. Yeah. And what I do is I triple her fat intake and she goes home and starts losing weight. Really? Really. It's amazing. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I you know, when you were talking about, you know, portions, you know, it made me think about how diluted our portions are in the United States. When you go to restaurants, they give you so much food. And a lot of times people will clean up most of what's on their plate. When, you know, when you were talking about, you know, a palm full of this and a palm full of that, and then you look, you go to these restaurants and they're giving you humongous plates of food. Well, if you go to other countries like Europe, you know, they give you very, very small portions and you look at it and you're like, how am I going to get full on this? But you know what? They cook naturally. They use the stuff in their backyards. So you, because it's natural and because it's organic, you do get full on those very small portions where we just gorge because we, you know, it's, it's, the, it's become the norm in our society and people just, you know, their stomach stretches too. And they start they need large quantities of food and they it's become habit forming also i think mentally and you know people gain weight and they gain weight and they gain weight and you know it's really people have to understand that we need a lot smaller portions and people shouldn't you know just because it's in front of you doesn't mean that you have to eat it all a lot of the times i ask my clients to weigh and measure the food at the beginning of a program Mm -hmm. so that they know how much they're eating and how much they ought to be eating. Right. And it's scary to the person who's doing this for the first time because it looks like such a little bit of food. <laughs> and then they sit down and eat it and they're done and they know they're done. Right. Right. I think the, the less you eat, your bot, your stomach begins to shrink and you, you don't have the urge to, to want to have those large portions because your body, your stomach is shrinking and you're, you're getting full and you're, so you're losing the urge to want to eat those large quantities. I know for me, when I stop sugar, I, um, I, you know, when I taste something really sweet now, I don't like it. You know, I, I lost my craving completely and I could taste when something had a lot of sugar in it now and I dislike it, you know, you know, what, and it was hard getting off of sugar, you know, it was like an addiction almost, you know, you're getting off of not putting the sugar in my coffee you know, or, or not putting it in, in a tea or, you know, and, and, and making sure the foods I was eating, you know, had very little sugar in it. And, you know, staying away from those bad foods. And, uh, but, you know, it, I feel better not having that sugar in my diet. That was hard work, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very hard work. Like, like I mentioned, it was like an addiction. Like we were talking about food addiction. You can easily get addicted to sugar and people don't realize it. And it, you, and you want it, like we talked about earlier in our conversation, the more sugar you have, your insulin level, you know, goes down and you urge, you know, you want more and more. And it's, and it's very hard when you're trying to get off of sugar. It's, it's, it's like, at, it's like stopping alcohol and, or, or drug addiction. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. It is hard work. What worked for you? I, I began to really, really watch what I was eating and slowly make adjustments to what I was eating. So if I put 
um, sugar in my coffee. I started to put less sugar in my coffee, then no sugar in my coffee. Then I got used to the taste of it. Or if I had tea, I just, you know, I just enjoyed the taste of the tea and not the, and, and didn't, I focused on the, the taste of the, of the, of the herbs I was drinking and not needing the sugar. And then when I was eating, I was being very careful, you know, what I was eating, like even the gummy bear vitamins, you know, I stood away from those, you know, those are all made of sugar, you know, they're, they're not healthy. You know, if people eat them, but the, the outsides are mostly made of sugar or the insides, you know, sometimes with ha their jelly ones, they have a lot of sugar in them, you know, almost nine grams of sugar. And they usually want you to take two or three of them, you know, so and, and the foods I was eating, I was staying away from the desserts. I was really trying to really wean myself off of sugar, you know, little by little by little. And I finally did it. Wonderful. And I think what your experience is what people have to realize is it takes time to do this. You can't do this overnight. You have to ha give yourself a chance. Yes. You get used to not using sugar. And did you have withdrawal symptoms? Yeah, I actually did. I did have some withdrawal uh, symptoms, you know, it was really hard. I really craved that sugar, you know, and so it was really hard. I had to just use different types of coping skills, think about really what that sugar does to my body and think about the outcome and think about what I really wanted for myself. And I had to, you know, I had to really retrain the brain, so to speak, and, and do different things to, you know, to compensate and uh, meditation is great you know, relaxing, you know, focusing on, you know, what your goals are long-term and short-term and uh, really thinking about what you really want for yourself and how bad do you really want it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other things like having a good cry mm -hmm. or taking a long walk. Yes. Yes. Or calling a friend and saying, do you have time for me to vent at you? Right. Yes. Or or going to a meeting, a support group meeting of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. um, or journaling. I love journaling. I think it's a very powerful tool. I always encourage it, my clients to to journal, you know, it, and it helped me tremendously. And I used I consistently journal. I even created a journal and I actually sell it on Amazon called the Positivity and Gratitude Journal because I think it's so important for people really to get out their emotions and also to focus on the positive things in their life and to be have gratitude in their life because sometimes we forget all the wonderful things that are in our lives when we just focus on the negative things and that could really pull you down too. Yes, it really does. So doing that can really help you. Another thing that works, which is a little bit odd, is using things that get your hands mucky. <laughs> um, clay, mm -hmm. finger paints, right? Uh, painting in general, mm -hmm. knitting, crocheting, and all of the needlework stuff. Right. Get your hands involved. In what you're doing. I was in a knitting store. I love to knit. I was in a yarn shop once and um, the sales lady was selling this beautiful Angora fabric to a woman. And the woman had the choice of colors and she said, I want the white. And she said, I'm sorry, Mrs. So and so, but you know, you always buy white for your yarn. Why is that? And she said, because, my dear, it is very hard to eat chocolate when you are knitting on white angora. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so that's true. We have to do the things that get us involved in creating the life we want and in diverting ourselves from focusing on that negative stuff and on the negative feelings yes. around the food eating and body weight. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. Now, if you had to give some tips to people that have, have an eating disorder that want to take a step forward and want to do something about it, what would you suggest to them? What are some tips that that could help them and that they could begin today? Drink extra fluid. Mm -hmm. Eat healthy food every three to five hours while you're awake. Mm-hmm. 
Um, if you eat bad food, uh, no, I don't want to say bad food, food that you know you're not supposed to be eating. Right. Take a deep breath, slam your hand on the table and say, end of it. <laughs> and then go back to your food plan. Don't decide that if you, because you made a mistake, you have to dive in head first and eat right. it all. Exactly. Clap your hands and say, that's the end of this. Mm -hmm. Wash your hands, brush your teeth, uh, wash your face, and get rid of the smell of that food. Right. Will help the most. Um, you need other people to help you. Yes. Go looking in your environment for other people who can help you. Yes. Um, there are a dozen 12-step meetings mm -hmm. that focus on food. Yes. They're all different. Mm -hmm. Go to one, you don't like it, go to another. You don't like it, go to another. Right. If you hear a friend talking about a 12-step meeting, ask your friend where he or she goes. Right. So that you can find a group of people that are supportive to you. Yes. 100%. A Christian program called Celebrate Recovery that is is designed for Christians. Mm -hmm. There's um uh where am I thinking of it? There is a a program designed for Jewish people in recovery, and I can't remember the name of it right now. Mm -hmm. Um and there's um, there are a variety of other support groups for people who have other emotional, mental, and spiritual problems. Right. I don't know anybody who really is gets abstinent easily without some form of mm -hmm. prayer and meditation. Right. So go look for whatever it is that pleases you that puts you in your space in the universe. Mm -hmm. The 12 step program calls it a higher power. It doesn't have to be a God. It can be the beauty of mother nature. Right. To make you feel whole and sane. Yes. And to look at yourself and how bad is it? And do you need a professional help? Right. Do you want a dietitian? Mm -hmm. To teach you how to go to the grocery store, how to get through the grocery store without buying your drug foods, how to read food labels and understand them right. and know what you can and cannot eat, um, how to set up your meals so that you don't have to cook for hours every night. Exactly. Um, doing that, how to find restaurants that serve healthy food. You know, you talked before about how you sit in a restaurant and they give you piles of food. Yeah. But if you go to a healthier restaurant, they don't give you quite as much. No, they don't. But if you ask for a take-home box when they bring you your meal, mm -hmm. put the food you don't want to see yourself eating in the take-home box and close the lid, then... You wind up eating only the amount of food you want to be eating. That's a great and, idea. And you get to take that box home with you. Yeah. That means that tomorrow night you don't have to cook. Right. I like that idea. I like that idea too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. I, I think those are wonderful tips. Now, can you tell the audience one more time where we can find your website? It's www.sanefood, S-A-N-E-F-O-O-D.com. And you can sign up on the website. I do a weekly blog. My blog this week is on drinking enough water, okay. coincidentally. And on Wednesday nights, I have a free group from 7 to 8 30 for anyone who wants to come and talk about food eating and body weight oh that's wonderful that's wonderful and that's on the website too excellent 
Teresa, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for, for providing all this wonderful information. And I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people because it's it's a, it's a very hot topic. It's something that many people struggle with. If we, you know, eating disorder is, is a very, uh, it's a topic that a, a good percentage of our United States and even around the world people struggle with, you know, and, uh, you know, you covered the psychological aspect of it, you covered the nutritional aspect of it, you covered, you know, the emotional aspect of it. And I, I think, you know, I thank you so much for, for taking the time to provide us with all this information. And, you know, I will, you know, encourage people to leave comments and even, you know, contact Teresa and leave her comments. And is there an email address that you use that, or is there something to contact us on your website that they could just ask you questions directly if they have a question? There is a contact information. Um, they should do info, I-N-F-O, at stainfood.com. And we'll, my secretary or I will answer any of their questions. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's been a pleasure meeting so you. So welcome. And, oh, thank you so much. I'm really happy that you took the time out to talk about this because this is definitely a topic that many people need direction on. So thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. I enjoyed talking with you. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. You have a great day. You have a great day too.